You guys doing well? Awesome. That was an exciting day for us. Um, and again, thank you uh, to our church for praying with us, fighting with us um, in the journey of parenthood. We went from zero to 100 very, very quickly. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my wife was four months pregnant when we had a phone call asking if we'd like to take baby Paisley home from the hospital um, and call her our own. And we said, absolutely. So within a few days, we had a newborn baby and a pregnant wife um, and then a liver transplant in, in a baby. And so a lot happened very quickly, and we owe it all to our family, our friends, our church for helping us through it. I started seeing a therapist last week, so we're, <laughs> that's a true story. I have another appointment on Wednesday, so we'll be, <laughs> we're sorting through all the trauma of what happened over the last 18 months or so. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, I'm just going to speak for a brief moment. My name's John. If you're visiting us today, I'm one of the pastors here on staff and uh, alongside our wonderful team. And I want to maybe set the, the framework for baptism today and hopefully give us an idea of the significant and radical response baptism is as Christians. And if you join me, I'll pray quickly. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. It's already here. We thank you that you've already created an atmosphere and an environment for us to walk into with boldness. And now I ask as I do my best to reveal through scripture the person of Jesus, God, would you... Do what you do best. Holy Spirit, would you do your work in revealing Jesus in us, among us, and through us? And uh, Lord, I ask that you would bring an attention to your name and your name alone in this place this morning. That there would be uh, a, a humility in the way we approach you today and that you would silence all voices of distraction. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Um, I want to talk about grace. I, I don't have slides uh, this morning. It, this is more just like a casual talk. Is that cool? Welcome to the living room. This is what we do every morning in my house. The girls sit down on the couch and I preach. That's, that's, that's not true. That's typically the opposite. <laughs> As you can see, the girls love the microphone. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, I want to talk about grace. Uh, I love this definition of grace. Grace is the life-transforming gift of God that will keep you and sustain you. Grace is the life-transforming gift of God that will keep you and sustain you. And for a long time, we've seen the narratives of Scripture, the gospel, the text, as some sort of drab, black and white display of a historical event. And it's through centuries of religion that has tried to dilute the power of the gospel into something that's just a, a, a historical account. It's black and white. Um, but what I love about Jesus is that he's alive, and that scripture is alive. It, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so as we look to Jesus today, we're not looking at a black and white drab display from thousands of years ago. If you will, we're looking at a painting, a piece of art that is still unveiling itself today. The beautiful thing about art is when someone paints a painting, it actually reveals itself for potentially hundreds of years in the way the paint dries. And the way it forms and takes shape over centuries. And uh, a, a few years ago, I had the privilege of going to the Louvre Museum. I think it was a privilege. I don't know. It was a lot of walking. Um, the Louvre is a, a museum in Paris. And uh, if you do the whole thing, you have to spend days. It's miles of walking through this museum. And uh, we kind of cut to the chase, went right to the Mona Lisa, called it good, and grabbed some lunch. Um, <laughs> I think over 14 days, we walked 100 miles in Europe because you just walk and walk, and it was outrageous. But in walking through the Louvre, I, I, I saw paintings that I had read about in school. I saw, you know, The Last Supper and ultimately Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and it's things that you've heard about, and, and you use that as an illustration for so many things in life, don't you? Oh, it's like the Mona Lisa, and there's this significance and this value to it, and just so you know, if you haven't seen the Mona Lisa, it's incredibly underwhelming. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very small that you have to stand behind a rope and there's a thousand other people trying to see the same 24 by 36 painting from feet away. But one thing, I, I was really taken back by this art because it, there's something so different about when you see it for your own eyes. There's like this grandeur to it. There's this, you feel the emotion of the artist. You feel all that led up and the accumulation of events to 
lead them to the commitment of painting something on that scale. And I, for myself, was changed in that moment through the Louvre and just the way I perceived art. It's a beautiful thing. And so today I'm hoping to paint an accurate picture of Jesus in front of us that somehow something would awaken and it would evoke in us some sort of response to Jesus himself. Is that cool? Because grace is not found in principles. It's found in the person of Jesus. Grace isn't a set of rules. It's not, a, it's not principles. Grace is the person of Jesus. So I hope to unpack him in a certain way. And what I love, uh, I have kids now and we have little children's book around the whole house. And I love those books because there's like six words in them. <laughs> But I think there's something to be said about children's books because they don't require a whole lot of words because children, with their imagination, their perception, they just need pictures. <laughs> and what did Jesus say? You've got to become like children to enter the kingdom. And so there's simplicity in what I'm going to speak today. There's simplicity in it. And I hope that we can behold the art of Jesus and the way he unfolds and portrays himself today as children. And I, I love this quote before I read some scripture. It's by Mike Iaconelli, he said, the grace of God is dangerous. It's lavish, excessive, outrageous, and scandalous. God's grace is ridiculously inclusive. Apparently, God doesn't care who he loves. He's not careful about the people he calls friends or the people he calls his church. And there's this great story about a sociologist named Tony Campolo who was traveling for, for business and found himself in Honolulu, Hawaii. He was from the East Coast, I believe, so when he got to Honolulu, it was about a six-hour time difference, and uh, you know how that messes with your sleep schedule, so he, late at night, went out to find a place where he can eat. He found this little diner that was open, and he, he, he found a seed, and he was eating, and while well, he's eating, these three women walked in, and he picked up pretty quickly that their work was on the streets, that they were themselves prostitutes working the streets in Hawaii, and he couldn't help but eavesdrop a little bit anybody just love a good eavesdrop <laughs> that's like what i live for man I, i've said this before but i've gone to disneyland by myself to people watch and eavesdrop that's a true story by myself <laughs> thanksgiving at judy's house and i'm gonna dip out for a little while I just went by myself to disneyland um but tony's sitting at a table and he's listening to these three women as they're eating and one of them just, just kind of mentions, hey, tomorrow's my 39th birthday. And the other two ladies start giving her a hard time. They're like, what do we care? You know, you're trying to get a gift or something. Like, no one wants to celebrate you. And uh, she said, you know, you're right. For 39 years, I've never had a birthday. So why would I imagine that tomorrow I would have a birthday anyways? And so, obviously, that struck Tony. 39 years. She's never been celebrated. She's never had a birthday. And so he, he leaves. The ladies leave. But he can't shake this thought. And at, on the way out, he, he just asked, hey, who, who are those ladies? And they, he said, they come in every night after work. And so the next night, you know where we're going with this. Tony talks to the, to, the, to the staff of the restaurant. And he goes out during the day and he gets decorations. And he plans a birthday party for this girl. And so they come in around 3 a.m. after they get off work. And the entire staff and Tony and a few other people sing happy birthday. And they celebrate this girl. And she says, he gets a chance to pray with her, and she asks this <laughs> significant thing. As you could imagine, she says, what type of church are you from? He says, the kind of church that throws a birthday party for prostitutes at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Back to the quote, apparently God doesn't care who he loves. He's not careful about the people he calls friends or the people he calls his church. That's grace. I want to maybe set up the framework for why this grace is so significant by going back to Exodus for just a moment where we receive the Ten Commandments. And I'll just briefly skim through them. Uh, in Exodus 20, starting in verse 1, God gave the people these instructions. You may have no other God but me. Don't make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or the sea. You must not bow down before them or worship them. And it goes on. He said, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath. Keep the seventh day holy. And uh, continuing on, honor your father and mother. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. And you must not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his ox, or anything 
that belongs to him. And so we were given these 10 set of instructions from a jealous God who is after the hearts of his people. And we understand in context why, context why we were given these 10 commandments. And uh, so some of us could hear that and you think, man, that's pretty steep. Yeah, that, that's quite the demand on a human's life to live up to these Ten Commandments. But it, I, could, I would encourage you to go home and start reading Leviticus as it gets more intricate <laughs> in rules and regulations and law on how to run your business and do relationships. And basically, every breath you make, every move you make, I'll be watching you. <laughs> Sounds like a song. Didn't Jay-Z do a version? That, I just... It's really good. I've got to find that. Puff Daddy? Is that who was did the version of that? Who just told me that? Awesome. Come on. Puff Daddy. P. Diddy. What is his name anyways? <laughs> and so the law escalates through Leviticus. What are we talking about? <laughs> the law escalates in Leviticus. So we thought the standard was high. It gets even higher. And now we can't walk. We can't breathe without some sort of rule, regulation, or guideline. And so with that in mind, I want us to dive into Scripture in John chapter 8. If you have your Bible, we're going to dive into there. And what you'll see in your Bible, your physical Bible, I, I have my, I just don't, I misplaced it. Um, and so hopefully I remember. Uh, there, there's this little text in there. It says, the earliest manuscripts do not include this passage. And for a long time, at least I've heard, that it has discounted or disregarded this significant passage of Scripture. Because, I don't know, if, if you're seeing that in Scripture, I think even digital versions say the earliest manuscript, Greek manuscripts do not include this passage. And, and I think it adds to the weight of it, because get this, in our modern society, in just our modern world, we can open up Scripture on our phone, or we can go to the parable and buy a a book, uh, you know, a physical copy of the Bible, which I encourage you to do. I'm not sponsored by the parable, but please go support them. <laughs> Maybe they'll send me a check. I don't know. Um, we can go out and get the Bible. We can go on our phone and get the Bible. But in, in early, early days, uh, you had to be privileged to actually have a copy of Scripture. And so what would have happened, the father of the household would have went to what was known as a copyist, and he would have requested a copy of Scripture. And what scholars would imagine is that in that exchange he would have had an influence on what was included on the book that he took home to his family and so he would say to the copyist hey can you leave out this scandalous encounter of Jesus because I don't want it giving permission to my daughters to go out and be promiscuous and then say Jesus forgave her he'll forgive me because the entire reputation of the family was tied and so intricately woven to the sexual behavior of the woman of the family and so somehow if Scripture gave permission for a woman to act a certain way, it, the whole family would be shamed, cast out, and sometimes even killed because of the actions of this woman. But there was a brave remnant of people who said, leave it in. <laughs> this is an accurate portrayal of Jesus and his grace and his mercy. Leave it in. And so that helps explain that little, that, that little portion in your Bible that says the earliest manuscripts did not include it. Because some people were brave enough to believe that Jesus is that good and we are those type of people here at this church. We're going to go back to John 7.37 real quick. I'll just read it. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus made some offensive claims in his day. And this, what he said about living rivers flowing out of the spirit of those who believe was directly quoting Isaiah 55. And so the Pharisees who heard this, in Jesus saying that, Jesus claimed to be God himself. He, he, he claimed to be the Messiah whom they had been waiting for. And so that obviously didn't make some people happy. It was blasphemy. He was, he, he was blaspheming the name of God and taking it lightly in his claims to be God himself. It was the seventh night of this festival, and there was this, you know, furious exchange. And they would have gone home that night. Scripture says that Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. So people would have dispersed after that night out of Jesus, after Jesus had made those claims. And uh, the guys would have left frustrated. And they would have had frustrated friends. And, uh, and you guys know what it's like to be frustrated around other frustrated people. <laughs> like your frustration multiplies quickly. 
And then like after an hour, you're like, I don't even remember what we were frustrated about, but I'm glad we're frustrated together. Right? <laughs> so these, these guys were, were frustrated. They were offended. And so they went home that night and began to banter among themselves of this claim that Jesus made. Uh, made. And so they had a roundtable discussion about how they might humiliate Jesus the next day. They were plotting and scheming. And this was the plan. Public humiliation. They were to put Jesus in a trap, and that next day they were going to make him decide if he was going to fulfill the law, which he as God would have instituted. Was he going to obey the law, or was he going to obey the Romans, or the law of the land in which they were having this festival? And they decided in in their planning meeting that they got to make Jesus choose a side, because either way, we'll set him up to upset somebody, and then he'll probably die. (laughs) Brutal. So, John Chapter 8, verse 1, here we go. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Will he fulfill the law or will he obey the Romans? See, it's just a disgusting story because these men had gone out and found a woman. They had set out to find a woman in a promiscuous scenario, not by chance. To set, they, they did it to set Jesus up. So they exploited this woman. Maybe she was living a lifestyle of sin, obviously because Jesus said, go sin no more. But they had set her up. And so it was a disgusting scenario. And they brought her in front of the crowds and placed her next to Jesus and said, Jesus, what are you going to do? Are you going to fulfill the law? Are you going to remain loyal to the thing that you instituted? Or are you going to remain loyal to the law of the land, the Romans? And I, I love this quote. I forget who said it, but it said, Jesus always had different reflexes. <laughs> he always had different reflexes. And the beauty of this is, is uh, I, I spoke something similar to this at, at a church, a totally different message out of this passage at a church in New Zealand a long time ago. And uh, I, I said this comment, yeah, I don't know what Jesus you know, knelt down and wrote in the sand, sand. and of course, this guy comes up after me. He says, I know what Jesus wrote in the sand. I said, oh, sure, guy, tell me what he said. And, uh, and he had this thing, and, you know, it was pretty good. He had a pretty good case to make. And, but for a long time, I was like, what did Jesus write in the sand? What did he write in the sand? It must have been something powerful and significant. But what I found out, actually, it does not matter what Jesus wrote in the sand. The fact is he wrote in the sand. Here's why. Because in the law, the intricacies of the law, this was Sabbath day that he showed up back in the temple courts. This was Sabbath day. And in the law, on the Sabbath, you do not write in permanent ink. And what a little detail. What a tiny little detail that on the Sabbath you wouldn't write in permanent ink. And so Jesus, knowing the full extent of the law, kneels down and writes in dust that will blow away. He writes in something that's not permanent. And people who are observing this say, oh, (laughs) he does know the intricacies of the law. Every bit of it. And he stands back up and those who have not sinned, you know, throw the first stone, leans back down. And what he did is he set the standard of the law against this woman and the accusers. And he said, I know what all of you are up against. You can't do it. And in that moment, there was actually grace extended to the woman and grace extended to the accusers because everyone should have been stoned. (laughs) They all should have been stoned. So he writes in the the dirt. 
And uh, they leave, the oldest first, because they were the example, and they were, <laughs> love this is about Jesus. They set out to humiliate him. <laughs> How humiliating. <laughs> but they were given the same opportunity in that moment to respond to grace. The accused and the accuser, Jesus had different, different reflexes, and he says, I know the intricacies of the law. I know what you're up against as an adulterer, as someone who's caught in the act. And I know what you're up against as one who gives judgment because the word says that whatever portion of judgment you give, it will be given unto you. And so I, I know what both parties are up against, but Jesus had different reflexes. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's a radical display of grace in the person of Jesus. And what I want us to discover this morning as we go into baptisms is this idea that today in baptisms we're simply responding to the radical grace of Jesus. It's this, this, this life-transforming gift that will keep you and sustain you. And every person in this room has been a recipient of grace. Why? Because in Psalm 103 it says, thank God he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. In Job... It says, if he withdrew his breath for one moment, we'd all return to dust. He gives his reign to the righteous and the unrighteous. All of us in this room have received the grace of God, the life-transforming gift. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy, not getting what you do deserve. We are recipients of so much mercy and so much grace. And if you're being baptized, would you make your way up today, um, those who have uh, Rebecca and a few others and awesome Courtney come on up Jacob Kissinger my man what's up Alec hey man long time to see you how you been good how are you good it's good to see you we used to surf together in Pismo when we were kids um Ephesians 2 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here it is, as we continue in service and we transition to baptisms, and the early church, they heard this message of radical love, radical grace that Jesus was extending to humanity. And I've preached this message before that when people received the gospel message, when they were given an opportunity to respond, it was synonymous with baptism. There was an urgency to be baptized. Paul, when his eyes were blinded, when he was still saw, saw, his eyes were blinded for three days. Someone gets a word of knowledge, goes to his house, he hasn't eaten, he gives him this word of knowledge, and before he goes and eats a meal, he says, can I be baptized? Paul and Silas, they get this prison guard saved. It's in the middle of the night. The prison guard's wife is showing hospitality at the home, and they all get saved, and they say, before we eat, can we get baptized? There's this urgency that's tied to the gospel message, that Jesus is reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sin against them. With an eternal hope, an eternal glory, I did a funeral on Thursday, my first one, and I'm so thankful that the guy was a Christian, because that would have been really difficult if he wasn't. But the celebration that it was, that we have this eternal hope, this eternal glory, a joy set before us, not only in the life to come, but in this life here and now, an abundant life. And all it is is we find ourselves in this position of the woman who's caught in adultery because we can all relate in somehow some shortcoming and our fears and our failures and whatever it might be, and there we are at Jesus, in the presence of Jesus, or maybe we find ourselves as the accusers, or could I say the proud, who have the same opportunity to respond to the call of Jesus, and they knew that they had some shortcomings as well, but they, they left, and only one person went forgiven that day. The lady, she stuck around. She accepted the grace and the mercy of Jesus. So we can identify with either one. Maybe we've thought that we've had it all together, and maybe we've cast some stones ourselves. I tell you that judgment requires repentance. Just as adultery requires repentance just as the scripture goes on and says this anything that is not of faith is a sin that requires repentance if there's a portion of us that has not considered jesus lord of our lives it simply takes a turn in looking to jesus to say you're the 
the Lord of my life. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my present. I trust you with my future. Forgive my sins. You'll be given a new life, a new creation experience. So before we continue, I want to extend an invitation because I feel the urgency today that maybe there's some people in this room that have never made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. It's really simple. Someone, I was talking to someone on the phone yesterday about hell, and I'm like, I can't get too caught up on it because it's just simple to avoid it. <laughs> it's just really easy. I'm not going to get too caught up. It's just a choice that I make to live in the presence of God and confess Him as Lord of my life. It's like really easy. It's not complicated. And this morning, I want to extend an invitation to anyone, one, that wants to make a decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior this morning trusting that he'll forgive you of your sins and you have a new creation experience and beyond that if there would be anyone in this room so bold that would want to take the dive today (laughs) that want to get baptized today and join these wonderful people you can borrow my towel we've got so we can just sort out the details when we get there but there's room for you in the river today there's room for you in the, the new life experience today feel the presence of God his spirit it draws us and it leads us and does the heavy lifting just maybe there's someone in this room as I have been talking that something's going on the inside of you and you feel like this pulse running through your veins you feel like your heart rate just elevated a little bit that there's something inside of you that just there's an urgency to respond to the gospel of Jesus today and accept him as Lord of your life and be baptized don't worry about what you're wearing we'll figure it out come on (laughs) Courtney brought an extra outfit I'm sure someone in here their car is really dirty and they could come on somebody awesome what's your name Heidi thank you look at this congrats Heidi anybody else who wants to make a decision to follow Jesus and be baptized have a new creation experience this morning anyone else at all who wants to join us don't worry about what you're wearing I'm sure there's a bunch of dirty cars out in the parking lot with way too many clothes in the back anybody else awesome come on we celebrate you beautiful Come on, we could do better than that. Come on. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Come on. Is this a... <laughs> it's a mom and her daughter. It's awesome. What was your name? Brandy. Awesome. <laughs> so cool. Oh, we got one more. <laughs> Come on. That's your mom? My daughter's getting baptized. That's your mom? Yeah. First time here. Awesome. This is Courtney's mom. We'll get to know your name. Just watch out. <laughs> watch out for that cable there, but come on in. Awesome. <laughs> so that's grandma, mom, And then granddaughters getting baptized today too. Three generations making a decision that's going to change everything for generations to come. Anybody else? We got time. We'll wait for you. (laughs) Isn't this good? One more chance. Yeah. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And if you think there's a day you'll be ready, you'll never be ready. <laughs> it's the beauty of this whole thing. You come broken, 
and then he pieces you back together. Sometimes we think we got to be put together to come to Jesus. But he didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Anybody else? <laughs> you guys feel that? What that is, is a residue of heaven rejoicing. There's these really thin moments where we get a glimpse of heaven and scripture clearly states, Luke 15, what happens when one comes home, they throw a party. So there's rejoicing, not only in this room, but in the heavens. There's a welcome home party. Awesome. Anybody else? Someone's phone's ringing. God's calling. Answer the call. Uh, <laughs> so good. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, we're going to pray a prayer. Let's get, like, can we get closer? Um, we're going to pray a prayer. Um, I know some of these people uh, will hear briefly their name and why they're getting baptized today. Some of them have been walking with the Lord a long time and are making the decision to publicly declare their faith. Some, it, it might have just been the last 30 seconds or so, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, but us in this circle, we're going to pray a prayer, and I, I hope that you as a church will join us in, in praying this prayer as we dedicate our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to say a line, and then uh, would you guys repeat it with me. And Would you guys join us? Is that all right? And uh, we don't believe these are just words. This isn't just empty religion. This isn't repetition. We believe scripture. When it says that you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. And it's more than just words. So would you repeat after me? Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Today I accept your grace, your mercy, your love, and your truth. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my present. And I trust you with my future. Today I make you Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Can we celebrate that? Woo! Um, 